I'm Tony DeQueer, the Associate Dean of the College of Music and Fine Arts. I've been at Loyola since 1975. And my background essentially is in uh, music therapy and voice. I've been an Associate Dean since 1990. Um, my educational background includes a Bachelor of Music Therapy from Xavier and Loyola, a Master's from Loyola, and a Doctorate from LSU. Music therapy. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I probably got into the, in this whole teaching profession is through music therapy. It's use of music with the handicapped. Uh, music therapists use various vehicles in, in order to engage handicapped clients in music. Some of them can be guitar, piano, voice. It can be all of those instruments as a matter of fact. But essentially music therapists structure the environment so the handicapped folks, handicapped clients and patients can experience music. We think that's important because we think it's important that every human being have an opportunity to express him or herself artistically. Certainly people who are damaged or people who have handicaps are typically the, the most common folks, the most common people that we see in a therapeutic setting. It could be adults, it could be children, adolescents with emotional disturbances. It could be those same adults, children with developmental disability. Um, years ago, we used to refer to developmental disability simply as mental retardation, but we know that that's, it's broader than just mental retardation. It could be autism, it could be physical disabilities, as well as disabilities um, related to age and senility and the whole aging process. So music therapists can work with a full range of individuals. Um, there also is a branch of music therapy that works with wellness and health and wellness. Uh, for example, normal functioning individuals could have problems with their voice, could have problems with carpal tunnel issues, overuse syndromes, um, and music therapists would, could be um, a therapy that uh, those people would uh, look into. The miracle of music, and my colleagues sometimes ref that my colleagues sometimes refer to as sneak therapy, is, is it will allow patients to maybe walk who could not walk before, and and that has to have to has to do with gait and rhythm, uh, very simple concepts that musicians deal with on a regular basis, and concepts that you and I uh, maybe don't think about. Um, uh, just think about on a regular basis, but the rhythm of the gait, the rhythm of movement is very important. Now, if you have a physical disability, for example, that ability, or maybe a spastic, that ability, that rhythm is sometimes can be lost. So it's very interesting to have music, a rhythm um, uh, put to a walk, a movement that would adds fluidity to that movement, thus making it a little bit more easy, um, a little bit more fluid, um, a little bit more accommodating to the, to the client. And this could be done either with folks, with individuals with a uh, physical handicap or with the elderly, or anyone basically who is experiencing a, 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 a problem with fluidity of gait and movement and that sort of thing. Yeah, the music therapy program at Loyola has been established since 1957. It is not the oldest program in the United States, but it is perhaps one of the um, a second tier of music therapy programs that started uh, around the mid, mid, mid last century. Uh, some of the first programs were started around 1950, University of Kansas, University of Michigan, uh, University of the Pacific was started a little earlier than us. We came along um, in, that second, in that second phase of uh, therapy programs. Our uniqueness is that we have been consistently and we have been um, fully engaged since 1957. So that's, uh, that's uh, pretty outstanding, really. Yeah, I was trained as a singer, and, and every music therapist has a primary instrument uh, as, as any, any individual who's in music. Uh, my background is in voice. I've had a lot of opportunity to sing um, over the years. My singing nowadays is, is pretty much relegated to funerals and weddings, and it's fine with me. Uh, I, I, do, I, I will do some liturgical singing uh, on occasion, but I'm okay with that. And, um, um, but you still enjoy it. You know, you still, matter of fact, I sang today. I just, you go in and you warm up. It, 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 
it has a way of centering your day, so to speak, and it gives you a sense of accomplishment. Um, and folks say, oh, you're performing for anybody. No, but uh, you never know. Uh, you get a, a call to sing a wedding or, or some other occasion, and, and, and you, there's a certain amount of fitness that you want to have at your disposal that continued constant practice and just warming up adds, allows you to have. The focus of the College of Music and now the College of Music and Fine Arts has changed dr uh, dramatically since 1990. Um, when I took the, um, the job of associate dean, our enrollment was right at 200. And maybe that first semester we dipped below 200 to maybe 195 or 198. And I was told by then the dean of the college, David Swansea, said, you know, we don't want to be below 200. And because being below 200 indicates a different size, you're in a different category of music school. Well, we, we got down to 190 or 195 and really never looked back after that. It's been constant growth. Um, when this building was constructed around 1986, uh, it was specced out for an enrollment of right around 230 students. Well. Uh, since that time, our enrollment, the, the music enrollment is somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 um, in, in the college. So we've, we've changed a lot. Over the years, um, especially since, the, since the, uh, the storm in 2005, the college has changed. We've, we've, we've um, added two other departments, the uh, Department of Visual Arts and Graphic Arts, Department of Theater and Dance are now a part of the College of Music and Fine Arts. Um, this seems like a natural and normal fit for this particular college uh, being in the arts, even though there are elements of theater and elements of visual arts that musicians don't understand, and, um, and there are elements of music that the visual arts and the visual artists and the theor theory, uh, th uh, theater people don't understand either. However, I think there are more similarities than differences when we speak about um, courses and course requirements in visual arts and in, in theater, the, as a musician we can understand that or it's not that far off from uh, our recollection as to explaining well why is that so as opposed to trying to, exp trying to explain why a certain procedure is done to a chemist or a biologist or something like that. For us it, it makes it easier. So the, so, the, so the match has been very good for us. It has cause that the college to blow up to in terms of right now we're at almost 640. I look today, today is the stats day when the official university stats come out and so we're at 645 students in the college um, which is huge. Structurally the college hasn't changed much. We're still basically a top-down organization um, and Dean uh, Boomgarten and I are, are busily trying to change that, that model uh, because it creates some inefficiencies, it, it creates some uh, road, roadblocks and jams and log jams in terms of the governance of the college. And another element of the college in terms of the college's growth that I did not mention is, is obviously the music industry program. Uh, music industry was first started at Loyola in 1975. At that time it was a Bachelor of Music with a minor in business and never the twain shall meet. Um, uh, since John Snyder's been on board, we've, we've created a, a much more integrated music business program in that you have music and you have a minor in business, but you also have music business. And this has been a very strong selling point that I've used when speaking with parents and, and prospective students because we know that music industry is a hot item around the country. There are lots of programs and lots of departments, and those departments live in a lot of different places. They live in journalism schools, they live in business schools, some of them live in music schools. What makes ours different? I said what makes ours different is the fact that we have an integrated music business element to that program, and that offers distinction. Um, that particular program has grown tremendously since, uh, well, probably since 19, since 2000, actually. And that's been another impetus to our growth. I see the college changing, a stru changing structurally, creating um, stronger department chairs, um, more autonomous department chairs, so that those department chairs can make certain decisions that typically I make at this time. Um, 
which I think creates somewhat of a bottleneck in the governance of the college. I think the people who are closer to the fire, so to speak, that is closer to the programs need to make those decisions to have a more vital role in the decision-making process. So in terms of the growth of the college, um, I could see where the college could grow even larger than it is, actually. As a matter of fact, we're the second largest college uh, undergraduates. Uh, if you look just specifically at undergraduate programs, um, the College of Music and Fine Arts is, is, is second in line behind the Humanities and Natural Science College, which is a big, big, uh, a big jump in terms of this college. For a lot of us who've been around university, been around Loyola a very long time, that's a different mindset. We have always been the smallest college in the university, and we're, we've always been the, 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 the smallest and the one that's most vociferous and, and the one that's the loudest, but now we're not the smallest anymore. So it's a, it's a different position to be in in terms of being in a university. Um, we have some growing pains. We have some, some administrative adjustments that have to be made that have to be made in order to make the college run smoother. When I speak with, with folks and ask them about supporting the college, I speak with a, a, with, a, with, a, with a tremendous amount of fervor and belief in the importance of the arts. Uh, I think personally that the arts are going to be a key element and is a key element in the resurgence of New Orleans. Um, arts do, they have a resilience. Um, it, is, it is something that every individual needs. So I, I enjoy talking about the importance of the arts and, and people can give to the arts. For even folks who may not have a, a lot of uh, experience as performers or what have you, but people can give, can contribute to the arts because it is something very tangible. It is a product that they can see, they can hear, um, uh, and they can experience at all times. I think in terms of this community and, and probably a lot of communities around the United States, we have to get folks engaged in the arts at a very early age. That does not mean that every student that, that's in a grammar school is going to go out and be a violin major or a voice major or, or a theater major or, or, or a visual artist. No, it means that every student should have an opportunity to express him or herself artistically. I believe that that ability, that opportunity for self-expression leads to contributors, knowledgeable contributors, knowledgeable consumers of the arts down the line. When I recruit a student, first of all, and I tell students this all the time, universities in a, to a certain extent are like buying shoes. There are tons of different styles out, but not every pair is going to fit every one. And so when I speak to students, when I speak to parents, I tell them, you know, you come in, you visit the university, um, you attend a class, you attend a history class, a philosophy class, religious studies class. You, if, if you're a performing artist, you attend a, a performing arts course. Um, if you are an actor, you get an opportunity to see what's happening in acting classes or theater classes, visual arts classes. If you're a voice student, I want you to get a private lesson on your instrument. Because I think it's very important for kids to have, and parents, to have choices. At the end of the day, we want you to come to Loyola, look and see what we have to offer, and, uh, and then put our offer, our programs on the table alongside the other four or five schools that you're looking at and make a decision based upon your interests. There'll be pluses and minuses and so on. So at the end of the day, you want to say, well, I'm going to choose X school because I think it fits me better. Um, and, and students sometimes, and parents, tend to choose schools based upon scholarships. Well, I understand realistically that that's a, that's a major factor, but it shouldn't be the only factor. Because these four years that a kid spends at a university are some of the most important, obviously they're formative years in the students and an individual's life uh, between 17 and 21 years old. So it's very, very important. Um, and so I look at kids um, who come to Loyola to visit. I look for their passion. 
How do they feel? Do they feel a sense of community? Why are you coming here? Certainly there are communities around the United States that you can go into where everything works fine, the, cr the trash is always picked up, the grass is always cut. Why do you want to come to New Orleans? We often get that question from parents, that is, why is my student going into the arts? And part of my response to that question is, why is my kid going into the arts? I said, well, that's what you grew. I mean, you, you, you put the seed in the ground, you watered it, you pruned it, you fertilized it, and that's what you got. You got an artist. Uh, if you didn't want an artist, then maybe you shouldn't have done that. But I tell, I tell parents, you don't want to go through life or have, have a kid tell you, you know, I, I saw myself on the stage of the Met, but you didn't allow me to pursue that. I saw myself having my own art gallery, or I saw, my, you, I saw myself as a, um, as a graphic artist, but you didn't want me to do that. Now I'm stuck doing this. Um, and I tell parents, you don't want that. You don't want that. This, this undergraduate, four-year undergraduate degree is very, it's formative, it's important, but it's also formative. Just yesterday, I received a letter from a student, uh, one of our alums. She was a visual artist, and she's approximately 27 years old. And she asked me, she said, you know, while I was at Loyola, I wanted to pursue visual arts, and I did, and I enjoyed it. But I also had a love for pediatrics, pediatric medicine. And I'm wondering now, is it too late for me to pursue a career in medicine? And what do I need to do? So as it turns out, I just received information on, on pre-med and pre-med uh, pre requirements, requirements to, take the, to sit for the MCAT and so forth. So I was able to give her that information. And what I told her is that medical schools and law schools are literally littered with artists folks who have pursued the arts as undergraduates and then gone on to do something else. How marvelous would it be to be in an operating room or be in another high stress environment all day to be able to go home in the evening and perhaps play your piano, perhaps uh, enjoy being a part of a community theater production, perhaps sit at your easel and paint. How marvelous would that be? And, and so I tell parents, you give the kid, let him play his or her hand out, as it were. Let, let's see where this thing takes him. Because at the end of the day, um, they're going to get there, but you don't want any, 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 anyone telling you, I have regrets, I, I, I went into this, but I really wanted to do that. No, go do that and play it out. At some point in time, it might, it might manifest itself, say, you know, I thought I liked this music thing. It's kind of like saying... Uh, coming in as, as a freshman in music, you mean I get to do music all day? Or you mean I get to do music all day? So I think we need to satisfy that urge one way or the other. Get an answer to that question. Yeah, it might be I get to do music all day, and I enjoy that. But at, in no sense is an individual who has completed a, a, an arts degree it is no sense is that a death knell, is that a death sentence. Um, these folks make marvelous, marvelous citizens and marvelous individuals and contributors to our society. There are lots of advantages to being a creative person beyond making a living. And some of those advantages are the, the discipline that is required to be successful as an artist. You have to, there's no shortcuts here. You can't cram the night before the exam. Um, you have, to, you have to put in the time. You have to practice. You have to practice at whatever it is, whether it's the visual arts or the, or, or, or the theatrical arts or the musical arts. You have to practice. That same discipline is that same discipline that makes that individual successful, whether he or she is a, pursuing an MBA, pursuing a law degree, pursuing a medical degree. That same uh, stick to itness is really what's important. To junior high and kids coming in, first of all, I say, do your work. Go to class, and the kids will say, well, which class? Well, they don't have that option, like college students can, college students can say, well, which classes? And my response will be, all of the classes. But go to class, study, um, continue to work on developing your GPA, your grades. Try to develop, a lot of times, 
good study habits are developed really early on in a student's uh, matriculation gr through grammar school and so forth. But knowledge, knowing that this is what is required. Smart students, I'm a firm believer that we are all given a certain amount of talent and it's almost about the same amount in a lot of areas. But some folks are able to marshal that talent and, 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 and stay with it and such that they become good students. I mean, if we were able to stick a thermometer in their brains to measure how much brain power they had, it would probably be not st statistically significant than anyone else. But what they do have is that ability to stay with something, to continue, to continue good study habits, Good students follow the directions. If the, student, if the professor says read chapter six, then the good student's gonna go ahead and read chapter six. It, 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 it's fairly straightforward. And so you tell our young kids, follow your teachers, do what you're supposed to, do your homework, take that extra time, try not, to, try not to take the shortcuts and always try to be prepared. This past week, I had a former student of mine visit me. She's currently working on pursuing a degree at Tulane and she left Loyola around 1990. And I'm thinking, oh, actually it was 1980, because she was 20 years ago. And I'm thinking, my Lord, 20. Um, then I get another email from a student, and, and email and electronic communications has really made a lot of this stuff very, very easy for you to pick up the email or draw the note and say hello. I think students want to stay in, in touch, in contact with their professors. Just want to say hello. We, we're all, all of us, still look for some, some sort of validation that we did the right thing, that we have an opinion that, you know, maybe I can bounce my ideas against somebody else who, um, it's, it's amazing the impact the teacher makes on the student. And oftentimes the teacher has no idea that he or she has made that kind of an impact. The rewarding part of my job, and I've been doing, I've been associate dean for 20 years, the rewarding part of my job is when a student comes to my office and I can make a situation go away, whether it's a financial situation, whether it's an emotional situation, whether it's an academic situation, where I can ease the pain so that kid can succeed.